Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. Let's do another reaction video, shall we? Why not? It's been a while since I did one. I've reacted to at least one Lenin documentary, and I also did a Trotsky one. I think this might be about just communism generally, because it's called History of Communism Documentary. So yeah, let's just jump right in. An economic and political philosophy, the founder of communism have known to be Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. I know it's stupid to stop it immediately at the first sentence, but that sentence is strange to me. The founder... What did it say? Let me let me check that. Again. An economic and political philosophy, the founder of communism, have known to be Karl Marx. I don't know. Maybe I'm having a stroke, but that sentence just sounds grammatically really weird to me. Their main aim was to bring an end to the class system that existed in the society, which exploited the labor class. Is this made with a text-to-speech program? Like, is that what's going on? Or is it just edited like that? I don't know. Private ownership would be eliminated. The necessities of the society would be addressed first before the specific need of an individual was fulfilled. In communism, there isn't really a necessary contradiction between the individual and society. So it's weird to say that society's interests are addressed first and only then the individual's interests. Because they're kind of the same thing, like, if the interest of society is to have healthcare, education, those kinds of things, that also is the interest of each individual. Many countries in South America, Asia, Eastern Europe and Africa follow this political philosophy. Later, in the 19th century, communism started to take roots in Russia, too. I don't understand why it says that... Countries in South America, Asia, and Eastern Europe followed this philosophy. Does it mean communism, or does it mean some kind of just collectivism more broadly? Because it says that South America, Asia, and Eastern Europe did it first, and then in the 19th century, communism started to take roots in Russia. The Bolsheviks gained power when the October Revolution happened. Russia was the first country where Marxist view was implemented in such power. I don't know, am I going crazy? Like, this is just, it's worded so strangely. It sounds like it's written by, like, a ten-year-old. No offense, but the Bolsheviks gained power when the October Revolution happened. Russia was the first country where Marxist view was implemented. In such power. Every sentence is so abstract, it's so general. It's like when you, like, if you have to answer a question in, like, a school exam, and you have barely any idea about what the answer could be, so you just try to answer in the most abstract and general way as possible, like, oh yeah, it was the first country where it was implemented in such power, like, it means nothing, what do you mean? Yeah, it was the first country where Marxist views were actually in control of the state. They were the Communist Party, and they sent their principles to all the European Socialist Parties. Again, what the hell does that mean? Like, what? what is this? I, I don't know, why am I so confused? This, this video confuses me. They were the Communist Party and they sent their views to the Socialist Parties. So they're talking about the Bolsheviks. So, do you mean, like, when the October Revolution happened and then the Bolsheviks tried to convince other parties to become communists? Parties who used to be in the Zimmer World International or parties who were in the Second International but didn't support World War I? Stalin was a leader who ruled Russia through communist philosophies. What do you mean communist philosophies? There's only one communist philosophy. And it's also kind of silly to call it Russia when the Soviet Union is not just Russia. But maybe I'm nitpicking. Communism comes from the French word communism, which has Latin roots communis and ism. Communis means for or of the community, while ism, which means a condition or action. French philosopher Victor de Upay was the first to have created the modern definition in 1777 in the book of Project de Communauté Philosophie. I did not know that, but somehow it feels a bit irrelevant to me. It comes from ancient Rome or something, but I just don't think it's very relevant to anything. The principles that he mentioned in the book was followed by him. <laughs> Again, this was, that's such a weird thing to say. The principles he set out in the book were followed by him. It's like... Yeah, you wrote the book, like, what? The principles that he came up with and wrote in his book were followed by him. Were they followed by anybody else? Like, I don't know, maybe I'm being childish, but uh, this video just confuses me. His book happens to be the backbone of the communist philosophy. I seriously doubt that, because I've never heard of the book. I've never heard of that book, and I've been a communist for 
a decade, almost. Maybe I'm just a moron, maybe I don't know anything, but... Maybe in some very loose sense, like, yeah, maybe communism somehow developed out of that, in the same way that Marxism developed out of Hegel's philosophy, and Hegel's philosophy developed out of other classic uh, German philosophy. Socialism is something which is basically something like communism. Again, what? Who? What? Who wrote this? Like, you can't use the word something twice in the same sentence. What the hell? Socialism is something which is basically something like communism. Like, come on, man. Maybe the person who wrote this doesn't speak English all that well. And if that's the case, then that's a tolerable excuse. That's fine. But that's a bit of a rough sentence. But if we look at the actual substance instead of the way it's written, socialism is something which is basically something like communism. What the fuck does that mean? Like, ah, uh, I... At one point, I made a decision that I wouldn't use profanity anymore on this channel, but these kinds of videos just make me slip up. And had become quite popular in France among the leftists. Had become quite popular in France among the leftists. Like, when? It's something sort of like communism. Well, what's the difference then? Please explain. And it became popular in France. When? And then among leftists. Well, who are they? This was even before communism originated. Okay, okay, okay. I think I understand what they're saying, but you would never understand this from actually just watching the video. But I think what they're trying to say is that communism is a French word, socialism is a German word, utopian socialism and utopian communism are kind of similar, they just use different words from different languages. So they're probably talking about like 1700s or something, or maybe 1800s. Both the words have different associations. Yes, they have different associations. Some developments can be tracked to different organizations which functioned in Americas and Europe as different associations, leagues, confederations and parties amalgamated them with their own political views. Now it's going into such detailed things, but I still have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Like, the words have different associations, some groups and some leagues amalgamated themselves in, like, Latin America or something. I have no, no clue what they're talking about. Could you please give, like, a date? What decade? What century are you talking about? And could you give at least one example of what party you're talking about? Some of the well-known leaders who have been known to have propagated communism are Fidel Castro, Ho Chi Minh, Marshal Tito, Lenin, Stalin, Karl Marx, Mao Zedong. Okay, so I, I thought they were talking about, like, 17, 1800s, like... They were talking about utopian socialism, but no, they're probably just talking about communism, like, throughout all of existence. But it's just weird because they said that some of these things happened even before communism originated, which, by communism, I think they probably mean Marxism. The idea of communal ownership of wealth and property goes far back to the ancient times, as that in Plato's The Republic and Pythagoreanism to as early as Christian church. Okay, I take it back. Like, now they're actually giving good examples, so that's good. Good job. Sort of quasi-mystical movements like the Pythagoreans and also the views of Plato. They're based on the fact that ancient humans used to live in primitive communism in tribes and all these... Uh, early uh, class societies like ancient Greece, they had a mythic view of the past, so they understood the past to be some kind of mythical golden age, uh, but it's actually just a romanticized view of the tribal society, which was uh, primitive communist. Same goes for uh, ancient Christians. German preacher and theologian of the early Reformation, Thomas Munzer, also had led an Anabaptist communist movement in the German Peasants' War. That is true. Now this is starting to get much better. So now this just feels like it's actually a pretty decent script, but then somebody like wrote it in Chinese or something and then put it through an auto-translate program and then it came out like this. One of the most famous works that Marx and Engels wrote was Communist Manifesto. It was first published on February 21st, 1948. Oh yeah, that's pretty funny, 1948, but that's obviously a just a little mistake, it was published in 1848, not 1948. volume of his famous work, Das Kapital, was published in 1867. The book was so much in demand that even Russia looked forward to an edition in Russian. I know I haven't said anything smart throughout this whole video, it's just all been uh, laughing at stupid things, but... I recently read, uh, I think it was the Marx biography by E.H. Carr, 
or maybe it was his book Romantic Exiles. I might be getting them confused because I've read so many E.H. Carr books lately, but in one of those he talks about how Bakunin volunteered to create a Russian translation of Das Kapital, and Bakunin wanted to do it because he needed money, but then he figured out that he could actually try to scam some money from a Russian revolutionary named Ogarev, who was a collaborator of another Russian revolutionary named Herzen. And Herzen wasn't willing to give the money to Bakunin, but when he died, Bakunin thought, okay, now we can uh, scam Ogarev to give us the money. And he did. And after that, he just said, screw it, I'm not going to translate Das Kapital into Russian. Because sometimes people say that the first Russian translation was done by Bakunin. And no, Bakunin probably was the first one to start a translation, but he never got very far. He never finished it. And Marx also wasn't happy at all about that. After the fall of Napoleon III, the socialists established Paris Commune in 1871, which was a form of government that did not last long, as its members were mostly executed by the revolutionaries of the opposite side. The Paris Commune was a form of government. That's all they say about it. And it did not last long because they were all killed. Gotcha. Marxist theory says the state would ultimately dissolve under Marxist government, but the Russian collectivist activist Mikhail Bakunin said that instead of this, the state would become more powerful and become dictatorial. Well, that's not quite what he said. Bakunin actually said that... Uh... Marxism is a Jewish conspiracy. Max Weber, who admired Marx for his ideologies, also criticized some of his suppositions when it came to nature of society. Max Weber was a sociologist. Many Marxists tried to adjust with this changing nature of capitalism and criticism. Edward Bernstein, for example. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of those people recognized that Marx was a smart person, but it's pointless to say that they admired Marx. They were enemies of Marxism. Weber did not support Marxism. Bernstein, well, Bernstein claimed to be a Marxist, but he just wanted to change everything about Marxism. He said that we don't need a worker state, we don't need a revolution, we don't even really need socialism, we just need reforms uh, within capitalism that eventually might lead to something else. That's what he said. The video said that these people who criticized Marxism, they were doing it because conditions had changed. That's what uh, Bernstein also said. Bernstein said that society is now democratic, therefore we don't need revolution anymore. And the economy is booming, so therefore Marx was wrong. That's how bad these arguments always are. Like, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a period when the economy was doing good. And all it took was that short period when the economy was doing good for these revisionists to turn around. Oh, see, capitalism is not going into crisis. Marx was wrong, therefore we have to completely revise Marxism. Well, of course, he looks pretty stupid when the next crisis hits, and it's obvious that capitalism still does have economic crisis, that capitalism has not moved into some kind of new crisis-free stage. When there's a period without crisis, immediately some revisionists come out of the woodwork and say, see, capitalism doesn't have any crisis anymore. ...on the treatment of the labor classes, instead of just stressing on revolution, as the conventional Marxist ideology says. And again, that's a straw man to say, like, oh, Bernstein was the only one who cared about the rights of the workers, while the Marxists were just going on and on about revolution. No, the Marxists at the time were predominantly talking about the rights of workers. They were also talking about revolution, but they were mostly talking about improving the conditions of the workers and also improving the legal rights of workers. October Revolution made the Bolsheviks powerful, and they began to change the structure of the company based on the principles of Marx. It hasn't even said what the Bolsheviks are. It just said that there was the RSDLP, which split into the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks, and then it says the October Revolution made the Bolsheviks powerful. Well, you would think that the Bolsheviks already needed to be pretty powerful to be, even be able to carry out the revolution in the first place, but they began to change the structure of the company. What company? Do you mean the country? The Socialist Revolutionary Group formed the Komuch in Samara. Now, is this actually a photograph of socialist revolutionaries? Is this actually a, a, a photo of SRs? Because it's a picture of sailors with a flag that says death to, death to the bourgeois, I think. The Russian SFA Republic was redesignated as Union of Soviet Socialist Republics in 1922. What is the Russian SFA 
Russian Socialist Feder- Federation Federative. What is the A? Like it's usually called the Russian Federative Socialist Soviet Republic. I don't know. Comintern was dominated by Kremlin till it functioned. Dominated by the Kremlin till it functioned. In 1921, Soviet Union attacked Mongolia. The act was to help the country fight the Chinese, who were then controlling the nation. Again, what a weird thing to say that, first of all, the Soviet Union was not founded until 1922, but it says that in 1921, the Soviet Union attacked Mongolia to help Mongolia fight China. Like, what a... What a I don't really know enough about Mongolia to explain fully what was going on, but there was a Russian white army which had escaped from Russia into Mongolia and had taken over. It was led by a white general named Ungern Sternberg. So Mongolia kind of was part of the Russian Civil War. And there already was also a revolution in Mongolia. It wasn't just something that was brought from Russia. Hungary was already disturbed with political ups and downs and soon had to face a defeat in the First World War in 1919. This commotion led to the formation of a social democratic party while the communists took the reign of the country in their hands. Really a weird thing to say. What do you mean the formation of the social democratic party? The social democratic party had existed already for a long time. Like what actually happened was that there was a bourgeois revolution which put a dude named Mihail Koroi into power, but the country was in such a bad crisis that he wasn't able to control the situation. They were still involved in the war, and there was a revolution of peasants and workers, so then uh, the government just capitulated and handed power to the communists. In other words, uh, the communists were able to come to power without much resistance. Some of the policies, such as the new economic policy, which was a free market policy... That has to be like one of the best sentences in this whole video. Some of the policies, such as the new economic policy, which was a free market policy... How can you use the word policy three times in the same sentence? He collectivized the farms. People owning little lands were usually targeted. People owning little lands were usually targeted. I went into this blind, not even knowing what this would be like, but it's almost incoherent at this point. He had a policy introduced in this international organization, which opposed all the leftists who were not followers of Marxism. He called them social fascists. So it says that the Comintern called all other leftists social fascists. Well, not really. They said that social democrats who were anti-communist and collaborated with the capitalists and with uh, fascism were social fascists. Common turn policy, even during that period, was to create so-called United Front from below, United Front with workers who support social democracy. They just said that social democratic leaders are hopeless, but that we should still unite with social democratic workers. Stalin promoted a movement in 1930s which was known as Popular Front. Yeah, and now it's going to the Popular Front. So then, after the uh, Seventh Congress of the Comintern, the Comintern line started to emphasize United Fronts and Popular Fronts even more. But even before that, they had a policy of United Fronts. There were mass migration of peasants who moved to the cities in millions. This came as a threat to Stalin, who feared an invasion from these peasants. I have never heard that before. Like It's such a weird thing to say that... Stalin saw it as a threat or an invasion that all these peasants were moving in the cities. Because actually, the Soviet government needed and wanted lots of people to move into the cities and be- and to become industrial workers. The country needed more industrial workers. The whole idea was that they would mechanize agriculture so that it would require less farmers to produce the same or even more food, which would then allow a lot of those people to become uh, industrial workers. What a weird thing to say. The Prague senior leaders of Communist Party were held accused for conspiring against the capitalist and fascist powers to have Stalin and other eminent leaders of the party murdered. Was this written by AI? Like, why does it say, say that? Like, they were not accused of conspiring against the capitalist and fascist powers, they were accused of conspiring against the socialist power on behalf of capitalists and fascists. So it's just completely wrong. Like, what is this? The third trial was a secret one. The Red Army commanders had to face trial. This is strange. So it says that there were three important trials. Zinoviev Kamenev trial, the Radek Pyotrkov trial, and then the third one, it says, is Red Army commanders. I guess they just 
Don't think the Buharin uh, Rykov trial matters. That's interesting. Really, really, really weird. Spread of communism, 1945. Interesting that it just completely skips World War II and then just moves on to uh, post-war stuff. I searched Mark's documentary and this was one of the things, one of the top results that came up. That's the thing, like, people say, like, oh, with the internet, you have all this information at your fingertips, but the top results that come up in the algorithm are like this. It's, like, almost worse than useless. While Czechoslovakia welcomed it, Hungary and Poland were forced to accept communist power. Again, yeah, that's a very odd thing to say. Most capitalist propaganda claims that all these countries were forced to accept communism. The reality, of course, is that in all those countries, communists had the support of the people behind them. People were willing to accept change such as limited nationalism of industry and growth of exhaustive social welfare state. This is like so clearly written by somebody who has absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Like, limited nationalism of industry. They clearly mean nationalization of industry. It's annoying how like, people make these videos where they talk about things in this very authoritative voice and they say, oh, this is what happened and this is what happened, but they they make like the most basic mistakes. They clearly don't have any, even the faintest clue of what's going on. Besides the concept of forced collective agriculture and recession of 1953 in Soviet, which first came up in Berlin, led to deep unrest in the nation. Again, what the hell does that mean? Like, let, let me, let's back up. What is, what is it? So it says that there were many other groups which were not communist, but they supported socialism. However, they did not support the recession of 1953. Like, I did not know that recessions were something that you could, like, support, which first came up in Berlin. Like, they say recession, but do they mean, like, the counter-revolutionary revolt in Berlin in 1953? They must mean that. But it's weird, because they say it first came up in Berlin, implying that it also came up in other places, which it didn't. It's so hard to understand what they're saying. The biggest challenge of Stalin was to control the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Biggest challenge of Stalin was to control the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Well, do you know what's wrong with that statement? It's because Stalin was dead. Because Stalin had died already three years earlier. It's like, how dare... Like, it's so annoying how these people make these videos where... He was dead! What are you talking about? Uh, I don't know, I shouldn't be mad, because, like, this is to be expected, like, all these anti-communist videos are like this. I suppose the lesson of this is that people should be more critical. When they watch something, they shouldn't believe it. They should check it. There was a social democratic party formed that stood against communism. What a weird way of explaining the Hungarian counter-revolution of 1956. There was a social democratic party that was formed. What do you mean? There were people from the old Social Democratic Party, like mainly the right wing of it. They re-registered the old party, but there were also countless other parties that were re-registered. There were two non-communist parties that sided socialism and also got their independence. It's so funny, they say there were two parties and that they don't mention which parties those were. What parties? Like, do you mean, uh, Smallholder Party and Petofi Party? That's my best guess. The quality is so bad, it's unacceptable, like, you shouldn't be able to do this. Leonid Brezhnev, who was a Soviet leader, ordered a military attack on August 20th, 1968. <laughs> what? 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 Like, uh, I'm speechless. Okay, yeah, so, so Stalin was crushing the Hungarian counter-revolution, and then in 1968, Brezhnev did something. So we're jumping from 1956 to 1968 for no reason, for, for some unimaginable reason. There's no rhyme or reason to any of this. 20th, 1968, as it destroyed the Warsaw Pact. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean? Brezhnev ordered a military attack in 1968 because it destroyed the Warsaw Pact. What does that mean? The Soviets also threatened to go against the British-French-Israeli invasion in, in Egypt. What? 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 Do these things have something to do with each other? Like, I'm, I'm so confused. I give up. I give up. Like, I, 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 I give up trying to understand what's going on. 
The Cold War was concentrated in the West Germany and West Berlin. Cold War was concentrated in West Germany. And there were many communist fronts that were set up. For instance, in West Germany, the Society of German-Soviet Friendship had about 13,000 members, but it was called a communist front and banned in 1953. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm sure that happened, but there were Soviet friendship societies probably in every country or almost every country, so I don't see how that really means anything. It was banned in West Germany, but... Soviet Friendship Society existed in Finland also, so I don't really know what that's supposed to prove. Zedong, along with his supporter Deng Xiaoping, began the Great Leap Forward in 1957 to 1961, aiming at quick industrialization of China. Industrialization failed badly, and agriculture output swooped down, which resulted in famine and led to the death of millions. I know this is a typical claim that people make, but it's not true. Like, how can you say industrialization failed badly? Deng was appointed to take out China from this mess. Deng used practical policies which Mao did not like. That's such a ridiculous thing to say. I have made a video about uh, the books of William Hinton. So anyone actually interested in this, they should uh, check out that video and check out the books that I talk about. Because William Hinton shows quite clearly and convincingly that Deng Xiaoping, he of course opposed the industrialization, but once Mao was able to um, get the policy of industrialization approved by the party leadership, Deng Xiaoping and uh, Lu Shaoqi, they tried to sabotage the policy by taking it to an absurd extreme. So it's quite funny that this video now says that, oh, Deng Xiaoping was so practical, while Mao, he was just a moron, and he didn't like practical policies, but it was the Deng Xiaoping and Lu Shaoqi group who were actually the ones pushing for really unpractical policies during the Great Leap Forward. They were taking an ultra-leftist line as a form of sabotage. And his allies removed the Cultural Revolution, which took place between 1966 and 1969. The Cultural Revolution in China was mayhem that happened between 1966 and 1976. Mayhem, huh? It's quite funny that they say that the Cultural Revolution happened between 1966 and 69, and now they say it happened between 66 and 76. It's almost like they don't really know what they're talking about. Like, it's so incoherent, it's amazing. Mao wanted to cleanse communism by getting rid of all traditionalists and pro-capitalists. It's funny how they say that they wanted to get rid of all traditionalists, like, Whatever that means, like, obviously, they're not going to explain what that means. Obviously, there was no blanket categorical uh, attack against all tradition in the Cultural Revolution. They did say that they should uh, get rid of negative aspects of tradition, such as, uh, you know, conservative values like sexism, chauvinism, superstition, uh, selfishness, individualism, those kinds of things, but they still, they wanted to uh, develop Chinese art even uh, research Chinese traditional medicine, because uh, even though Chinese traditional medicine, in my opinion, is not uh, scientific, because it's, you know, it's ancient, but it has a lot of empirical data. They collected all these different plants, and they, you know, categorized different things, and the communists, they were uh, going through those, trying to see uh, if some of these plants actually have uh, medicinal purposes. And I think... At least I've read uh, somewhere that even uh, modern uh, pharmaceutical companies, they go through these uh, like ancient books to see what plants uh, different cultures have uh, collected and used for medicinal purposes, and then they carry out actual um, chemical analysis on these plants to see if they actually do contain some kind of substances that they can turn into modern drugs. So they did not condemn all tradition just categorically. They wanted to look at tradition critically and then see if there's anything... Uh, negative that they need to get rid of, and something positive that they can use and develop further from tradition. There were millions who were accused of treachery against communism. Mao said that the revisionists should be violently removed. What he actually said was that the Cultural Revolution should be non-violent. Just a tad bit of a difference there. Some people did engage in violence, and you know, some of these factional groups even violently fought against each other even though it is going kind of too much into the details, but I should say, and I, I talk about this in my William Hinton video as well, but when the Cultural Revolution started, uh, the right wing of the party, 
was actually trying to co-opt the Cultural Revolution. Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, they themselves tried to take control of the Cultural Revolution. They tried to get their supporters to attack other people, basically, to divert attention from their own uh, revisionism. Of course, that didn't succeed for very long. Eventually, uh, they themselves were accused of revisionism completely justifiably. But most of the violent excesses, the violent acts, were uh, actually committed by the revisionists themselves. If you want to learn more about this, then William Hinton's books, uh, they talk about this, I think, through Glass Darkly talks about this, but also uh, Mobo Gauss, I think his um, Maybe Battle for China's Past talks about this, I forget, but Constructing China definitely talks about this, so you should check out Mobo Gao's work as well. Eurocommunism had become quite popular in countries of Western Europe. Eurocommunism is basically just reformism. Eurocommunism very quickly degenerated into just regular social democracy. Of course, revisionism generally tends to do that, but Eurocommunists, they just said that they're not going to have a revolution, instead they're just going to vote in parliaments, and they generally did not want to establish a worker state, they had no clear idea of what a worker state should be, they just pretty much wanted to keep the regular bourgeois parliamentary set up. Of course, there have been movements like that even before... Khrushchevite revisionism, but Khrushchevite revisionism and Brezhnevite revisionism made it a lot worse because Khrushchev and Brezhnev both said that peaceful parliamentary struggle should be the main form of class struggle, especially in Western Europe, which really boosted the credibility of Eurocommunists, who said that it's not only the main form of class struggle, but it's the only form of class struggle. And also the fact that... Uh, Khrushchev and Brezhnev said that the Soviet Union no longer has a dictatorship of the proletariat. That really boosted the credibility of the Eurocommunists who were saying that they don't need a dictatorship of the proletariat in any country. But Soviet revisionism did not only help Eurocommunism in that way, it also helped it more indirectly because Soviet revisionism claimed to be Marxism-Leninism and it kind of discredited Marxism-Leninism in the eyes of uh, some people, so they became Eurocommunists instead. That's why, like, for instance, Brezhnev's intervention into Czechoslovakia caused some people to think, like, oh, well, Marxism-Leninism must be bad, so let's become Eurocommunist instead, when in reality they should have seen that Brezhnev was not a Marxist-Leninist at all, he was a, a revisionist. Fall of Communist Powers, 1980 to 1992. Communism did not collapse in 1989, it was revisionism that collapsed in 1989. The revisionists that came to power in those countries had already restored capitalism, and now their power was crumbling. Vietnam, People's Republic of China, and Laos all began market economies, but there was not much privatization done in the 1980s and 1990s. China privatized agriculture throughout the 1980s, and they also did that in industry. I don't remember the percentages off the top of my head, like what percentage of industry was privatized in the 1980s, but there was a lot of privatization. China still happens to have a communist government. China happens to not have a communist government. After market economies were introduced in China, the economy of the nation has been growing in leaps and bounds. That's a whole big topic in itself. Like, if you want to know about the Chinese economy, you should read, like, Pao Yuqing, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in China, and From Victory to Defeat. Those are good books to check out. Uh, China, of course, does have a big economy, uh, a lot of productive forces, even though they do produce mostly for a foreign market, and they're even often owned by foreign capital, and the people don't really benefit from them. But in terms of GDP, yes, there has been a lot of growth, although, I mean, China's GDP growth annually is like 6% or something. In the Mao era, it was more than that. Of course, the country was poor back then, so you have to take that into consideration. But when they say that, oh yeah, back then, under socialism, the economy didn't grow and now it's growing really fast, it's not really true. Although China helps to protect the borders of North Korea, it doesn't supply it with any other things. What, what do you mean? North Korea is full of Chinese products. China sees North Korea as a market. China sells North Korea all kinds of products. 
Yugoslavia saw the end of communism on April 27, 1992. Well, in actuality, Yugoslavia never had communism, and if you mean socialism, Yugoslavia never had socialism either. Yugoslavia was building socialism, but it was completely sabotaged by the Tito ad revisionists. Yugoslavia was ruled by Tito, who was the opposite of other communist states. His relations with the Soviet were not good, but he had quite good relations with America. <laughs> what a funny thing to say, like, I mean, yeah, that's true. He was a communist, but he was the opposite of other communists, and he also was good friends with America. Yeah, what an interesting video. That's that. Uh, if you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. And if you want, you can support me through Patreon. There's a link in the description. There's also links to my blog, my Discord, and all that stuff. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.